to the fifth national conference, uh, we realized that there were so few who wanted to talk about it openly. And it's true because the culture and background of Malaysia on these issues is always don't talk too loud, it's sensitive, it's sensitive. And it came at a period when yeah, it was not the best of period. Now it's even not the best. Uh, this nation, every moment is difficult to, uh, to want to unpack and change that notion of race relations. So, in 2006, we started with a series of uh, training on non-discrimination, bringing 50, 40, 50 people of all ethnic groups together for four days to discuss what was in their mind that they were not able to speak out openly. So that safe space provided a lot of insights about what Malaysians really thought. And so this we call you know, the thought bubble, the secret thought bubble. And that bubble normally is only spoken in hush-hush among your friends, your family. But I think if you don't get a chance to talk about it and understand where we got these ideas, that will be Malaysia's legacy for generations to come. And I think that's something we want to uh, want to stop. I remember in one of the workshops, we always end the workshop with a, a very symbolic memorial ceremony to the tragedy of May 13. Because that's the boogeyman that uh, uh, the ruling party, those in power, has always used to threaten anyone trying to discuss history. But for me, what I remember was, all we did was just sit in a circle. We put some flowers in the middle and we played some music and said, let's reflect about the tragedy that was a tragedy for all groups in Malaysia. All Malaysians suffered. Either you, you lost a relative or a friend or somebody. And then people started breaking down and crying. They said, oh my. And then they started telling their stories. There's some older gentleman and woman there who said, I had so much in my heart to say about it and this was the first time I could speak openly. Then we realized that this tragedy was a tragedy for all Malaysians. One death is a death for all Malaysians. And then that was a nice closure for this group that they were able to talk, share, cry about it. But this is something the nation has not done at all because we're not allowed to unpack that political history of, of Malaysia. So we hope that through such conferences such as this, we get a chance to talk openly, to discuss, to share, and also to to, uh, to give ideas how to move the nation forward. And uh, it always mirrors what's happening in the political scene in the country. Yeah? When there's a political crisis, then people exploit uh, ethnic relations and race relations to the maximum. So this is Comas in 2006 starting a program when no one else was really doing it. And we, we are so happy to say that uh, next year, in the 10th year of the program, we've done five conferences and been able to hold on to this. We've done short videos. And the videos, the only idea of the video is that to spark a discussion. So this program is among a few other programs of Comas that uh, was started in 1993. Comas is uh, 22 years old now, a small NGO of uh, staff team, we have four staff team, uh, you may have got emails from Ryan who's sitting in front here, uh, another coordinator, Lina, who's the MC for today, Farewell, and Anna. A few of us have been holding on to the program of Comas since 1993, uh, trying to bring, uh, using human rights education via interactive processes. So, how to talk human rights without a lecture style. So we do a lot of work with communities before. We worked, uh, we continue to work with the Orang Asli community and I think you see some of our, the network of the JKOAS and Jaringan Kampung Orang Asli Semanyu Malaysia, I think 10 of them behind, who continue to lead that program and we support them uh, where we can. Uh, we have a very uh, extensive program called the Freedom Film Festival. It's a human rights film festival. It's running in its 13th year this year and it's going, it goes to different cities and every year three or four local Malaysian films are highlighted. So this is among what uh, Comas does uh, for, for our work uh, for Malaysia in the last 20 over years. It remains small organizing, like most NGOs in Malaysia, we don't have that 20, 30, 40 staff to, to try to take it forward. 
it's a few staff and many volunteers who, who take it on. So, I'm hoping that uh, today with this discussion, we will be inspired by our speakers. And so, I want to give a big thank you to all those who have taken the trouble to travel, to come, to prepare for this. And I want to give a special thanks to our guest speaker for our keynote, Mr. Firosho Kame from South Africa is in France. So, give him a hand, please. Firosho, thank you. Uh, I see Mr. Rafi from Singapore, from the NGO Marwa. I can give him a hand. He's also in France. Among, uh, and the whole Malaysian set of speakers is a whole group of them, and I think we'll introduce them properly later uh, via the uh, moderator. The reason we invited neighbors and friends from South Africa and other countries is that I think we need to learn from their struggles to inspire some new ideas for us. Okay, and this year's theme on the path to non-discrimination. So we are quite hopeful and positive that. All is not lost, so we are on the path. And we are saying no to racial politics. So this is a big, big question in Malaysia. Even despite such good roads, such good buildings and uh, infrastructure, all those very slow internet, but everything else is quite fast. How many of you think that we are ready for saying no to racial politics? How many of you think that Malaysia should go into the direction of no racial politics? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, then the house is like almost there, okay? So, most of people, our hands are up and we need the same hands up in parliament today. If we ask this question in parliament, how many agree to saying no to racial politics? It's going to be difficult because our political landscape, the party political landscape was started off with an ethnic uh, uh, framework in mind. And that's why we are stuck because that ethnic framework is still uh, dominating that Malaysian landscape. And I think it's time for us to say that's all politics and we need to find a way to move forward. Many countries have changed their political history and I don't think there is any justification for us to say, well, that's how we evolved, so we must continue. I think it's up to us, the Malaysian citizens, who actually has given a lot of strong messages to many parts of society that we need to change. We thought that non-racial democratic constitution which has been hailed uh, as the most advanced constitution in the world has its own fault lines. Uh, 21 years later, we are discovering that there are many fault lines in the South African constitution. Uh, both experiences from politicians as well as government officials show that the implementation in word and in deed is far from being achieved. Uh, let me illustrate this by way of some examples. Firstly, in terms of the powers of the president, uh, no less than the deputy president of the Constitutional Court last year uh, illustrated that the wide ranging powers of the president that he has to appoint what we call functionaries is a wisdom feature of our constitution. Of course, when we were writing our constitution, the president that we had in mind was uh, Nelson Mandela. Subsequent presidents have come into power and you can see the erosion of that uh, constitutional powers in the appointments that have been made by the president. Uh, Deputy judge that criticized this provision in the Constitution was Judge Tikhan Musaneke. Uh, and he speculated that South African constitutional experts uh, that South Africa reconsidered these powers of the president. The question posed by the commissions or in Parliament are important issues for us to discuss in terms of 
the powers that are vested in a principle. The Judicial Services Commission uh, appointed to receive nominations and recommend judges at the three layers of the courts that we have in South Africa also bears some uh, measure of uh, perspective in terms of understanding how judges are appointed uh, to the South African courts. And I think that the commissions are appointed on a proportional basis and that in and of itself creates difficulties in South Africa. Because the majority party always dominates the proceedings and is able to vote for its preferred positions. A further fault line in this regard is the fact that members of parliament vote on the basis of decisions that are made in their caucuses and not on the basis of their conscience. So let me illustrate this with two separate examples. The one was a vote on women's issues in parliament, and the other was a vote on the abortion uh, bill that was passed in parliament. MPs who opposed the ruling party positions were quickly redeployed to other positions within the government. In many Christian and Muslim MPs absented themselves from the House on the occasion when the vote on the abortion bill was taken some years ago. A further provision in the Constitution is uh, establishing Chapter 9 institutions. These were institutions that were established to ensure that democratic rights were sustained and improved upon and deepened in our democracy. So we established things like the Gender Commission, the Human Rights Commission, the Election Commission, and the Public Protector. All of these commissions, when they came into conflict with cabinet ministers, have found themselves restructured, their budgets cut, and uh, functionaries moved out. In the past two years, the independent public protector who visited Malaysia a couple of months ago and who reported on various abuses and corruption in various government entities and departments has come under severe pressure and personal criticism from members of the ruling party. Her position has never been defended by the ministers in cabinet. Instead, she has been it has been left to civil society to defend her and the reports that her commission has produced. We've also constructed something called the demarcation board. This was appointed to demarcate provincial, municipal, and world boundaries to ensure that the vote of each citizen was equal to the vote of other citizens. In recent times, though, provincial boundaries have been shifted and municipal boundaries have also been shifted and re-demarcated to ensure that the majority party gains its hegemony over these jurisdictions. Like yourselves, we have had affirmative action legislation passed in South Africa. This was to obviate the marginalization of indigenous communities in South Africa. We embarked on an aggressive policy of affirmative action. However, consonant with other countries, merit and competency has quickly been thrown out of the window and political appointments replaced these scientific selection procedures that we put in place. So instead, ministers will appoint functionaries of their political allegiance and use country deployment to the detriment of the public service. Like other countries, we've also experienced a tremendous amount of tender corruption. Almost 700 billion rands, it has been estimated, has been lost by the fiscals to tender practices at every level of government. In recent years, we've seen xenophobic violence. Twice in the past 10 years, first in 2008 and more recently at the beginning of this year, various migrant communities from Ethiopia, Somalia, Congo, Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, where living in South Africa had been attacked. Their stores have been looted, their houses have been razed, they have been physically attacked, and many have been killed. Few, 
if any, meaningful prosecutions have taken place. And many of these communities are attacked mainly for economic reasons, primarily as they own successful businesses and are abused or causing poverty and unemployment. Buying our property in poorer communities or establishing their own religious or secondary schools. Target deployment, as I have suggested, the ruling party has also deployed its own memories to practically every structure and sphere of government throughout the country. This has had various negative consequences. Capacity and competency has been sacrificed and has, corruption has mounted and impunity has increased. The military and police services have suffered a similar fate, rendering both ineffective and often an embarrassment to the state. South African military personnel, when deployed in other countries in Africa, have been regularly accused of rape by the local populace that they were meant to protect. Police services are indistinguishable from criminal activities in the country. Regional rivalries are often present and competence in security is sacrificed on the altar of personal gain. The public sector wage bill has increased by some 40% because of the government's non-interest spending compared with some 25% in other BRICS countries. The overshoot in the 2015-2016 budget year is some 63 billion rands. Wage negotiations earlier this year with the political parties, trade unions and alliance partners settled at 8.2%, well above the 6.1% inflation rate. Without commitment <coughs> improvements in the quality of service, and productivity gains, this increase is not sustainable. The government wage bill in 2010 and 2011 was 300 billion rands. In 2016-2017, it is 509 billion rands. And it's expected to rise to 539 billion rands in the next year. Money available to vacant positions is now being applied to satisfy these wage demands, resulting in less efficiency and effectiveness in the public sector. This is also bad news for unemployment. Public sector employment has been the main driver of job creation in South Africa, given that the agriculture, mining, and manufacturing sectors have diminished in economic importance and contribution to the GDP. This has also led to less funds being allocated to key public sector infrastructure, limiting the government's ability to deliver on essential programs. This inevitably reduces the rate at which government services has grown. Attacks on domestic uh, citizens has also increased. In areas such as KwaZulu-Natal, a province in which mainly indentured laborers were settled during the British occupation to work on sugarcane farms, a virulent anti indian group has emerged with impunity. They have proposed slogans such as, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. The police and the prosecuting authorities have failed to act successfully against this group and its leaders. Now, I think it's important to bear in mind also what has happened regarding the students' uprisings that we had last week. In June 76, when the students took up the struggle against the <coughs> use of Afrikaans in the classroom, it took almost 12 hours for the rest of the country to know what had occurred on that fateful day. There were at that time only five telephones in Soweto, owned by a few black doctors and businesses. A few days later, colored and Indian school children in Johannesburg and later in other parts of the country joined the protests until schools in the townships across the country were shut down. These actions took place in various racially divided apartheid-established communities. 
It was only in 1993 when the United Democratic Front was established that racial groups came together, united in the common objective to overthrow a party. Seven years later, when Mandela was released and the country embarked on an ostensibly non-racial future, did these groups come together and work together. However, last week, across the country, university students closed the universities and demanded a 0% increase in university fees. The universities had proposed a 10% increase in fees, which indigenous students could not afford. After three days of protest, including an attack on the parliamentary precinct in Cape Town, the legislative capital, and the next day in Pretoria on Friday last week at the Union Buildings, the administrative capital, President Zuma announced that there would be no fee increase in 2016 and established several committees and commissions to investigate the students' grievances. What was salutary of the student protest last week, to my mind, was that students across the racial divide were united on their campuses. Students of all races and classes stood firm and joined protest and sittings throughout the country. Students used social media so effectively that 200,000 tweets were made on Thursday last week and over 100,000 on Friday last week. The use of the leadership has also changed. Biko, who has passed black consciousness, would have been proud to know that these student protests were led by leaders across the country, irrespective of race or faith. They were united in their objective using the hashtag Fees Must Fall. I think in the history of South Africa and the history of Africa, various positions have been taken. And these positions have their roots in colonialism. And partly it was colonial imperialism that has cheated uh, the notions of slavery in our countries. Slavery throughout the ages has been premised on the notions that a slave is a commodity. The notion is steeped in property law in the West. That a slave is a chattel, the slave is invisible, the slave is the property of uh, and inherited through their slave status. That the condition of slavery is perpetual and the slave is property and the slave is kidless, marginalized, and an outsider. Fanon, the Algerian philosopher, died when he was diagnosed with blood cancer, returned to Algeria from France, and in a period of about 10 weeks, wrote his book, Wretched of the Earth. To my mind, Fanon's voice is the voice of a native revolutionary with a clear insight into his condition and that of the people around him. He aversed that racism places one group below another. Fanon advanced the provocative view that decolonization was a Mancinian and violent process that renders ridiculous Western values. That the lived experience of both the colonizer and the colonized needs to be inspected. In effect, colonialism makes one group of people into gods and the other group creatures beneath animals at worst and subhuman beings at best. Violence, he agrees, is the great leveler in bringing the colonizer down. Violence, Phnom argued, was in and of itself revolutionary. And others who followed him, Césaire, Senghor, and more recently, Ashir Membe, remember that his violence of justice and purity and intransigence was structural. This is a difficult dose, dose of reality that all revolutionaries have to face in struggle. And in South Africa, we came to this crisis and catharsis in the Middle Ages when we started debating for ourselves what is a just struggle and what is the role of faith-based communities in our just struggle. So I leave you with that provocation that whilst racism is a culture and therefore perceived to be normal, race superiority follows a flawless logic. It is a logic that is perpetuated by politicians and officials in communities that draw substance from the exploitation of others. 
and it is for us to start arguing against colonialism and racism and adopt positions of anti-racism. In South Africa we speak continuously, and I must admit practically little of it, of a concept called Ubuntu. That I am a human being because others are human beings. That I am part of that humanity. Years of liberation in Africa, whether it was Nkrumah, Senghor, Kenyatta, Nerere, Sekuturi, Sankara, or even Kaunda, also spoke of the African communal spirit. The spirit was variously defined in African traditions and villages as humanism, dignity, integrity, and values. Later, African leaders adopted these concepts and according to these principles, notions such as Juma, Harambi, and humanism. When we speak today of post-colonialism and post-racialism, we are speaking of the reversal, of the pushing back of colonialism and racism. We need to aspire to an era of anti-racism and reject race and race identity in every section of our communities. Hage, in his book on, in 2014, helpfully recalls the past distinction between exploitation on the one hand and extremism on the other. Goldberg, in a book published earlier this year, adds racist articulation of racial dismissal. He says that this hides racism. He maintains it makes racism opaque and silently perpetuates racial power and privilege. And even in South Africa, 21 years after democracy, we still fully informs that identify us by race. So we have to tick a box that says, are you white, Indian, colored, or African? And that in itself is an identity that we should reject. I am hopeful that the South African experience in the hashtag Fees Must Fall campaign is the incipient bringing together of youth to signal a deeper set of concerns about racial conditions. However, the structural conditions of wealth distribution and wealth gaps, unemployment in, and inequality in South Africa makes this a difficult proposition. Given the recessionary climate we face, the lack of economic growth, and the large number of almost 45% of youth that are unemployed, who are neither educated nor employable in our society, and which has a 40% <coughs> HIV AIDS infection rate under the age of 25 is a powder cake waiting to grow up. Racism in sport. We said that there could be no normal sport in an abnormal society, that we could never tolerate racist quotas in sport uh, teams. This has been long forgotten by the sports administrators as well as the sport politicians. An unforgivable racial remarks expressed by a white attorney last week, acting on behalf of black minors suffering from silicosis, has raised the anger of lawyers in South Africa. Various members of the Bar Council have sharply raised the issue in our courts where the hearing is taking place. So these figments of people's imagination and this unthought of tweets and remarks that politicians, officials, and other people powerful in our society spark racial uh, anger, frustration. And we had a very devastating uh, situation back in 1948 uh, when we had experience of the so-called racial riots between the Indian population and the African population in Durban. The media is not blameless in this either. Often, not adequately and exhaustively researching an issue, they rely on anonymous tip-offs and ghost informers. The truth is sacrificed, producing a narrative which raises tensions. The number of complaints to the various media ombudsmen have increased over the past 10 years. So reporters who are lazy, Newsrooms that are empty because of syndicated news uh, that is being produced in South Africa cause these difficulties 
in our racially strife torn communities. Coming from such a fractured society, far be it from me to provide advice or remarks to you. Safe to say that we have started a journey which is still young. We need to settle down and sink its foundations deeper each day and aspire to do better rather than sink to the quagmire of despondency or inaction. To paraphrase Gandhi, we need to be the change we want to see. Thank you. My question is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Jared mentioned it just now, the, the constant argument that we always face uh, when we talk about racism in Malaysia, and that's the 13th May 1969 riots uh, that occurred, and it's been 45 years since that has actually occurred. And the thing that I would like to ask your opinion on, reflecting on your own experience uh, in, in South Africa, is in the South African experience, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was critical in terms of providing closure to the sins of the past. And, you know, it's, it's been 45 years since 1969. My question to you, is it of any benefit for us today here in Malaysia to have a similar mechanism set up to address some of the concerns, issues, and and some of those wounds that came out from that experience. Because today, what's happened is that we prefer to not talk about it. We prefer to pretend that it never happened, or we use it as a as a boogeyman to scare people from some of these discussions. But some people who have actually uh, spoken about it have said that such a process could instead open up old wounds, tear off scabs, and create more uh, problems as opposed to solving them. But I would like to get your your, your opinion on that, whether we should actually have a simple process so that we can put it once and for all and move forward because it seems like we're continuously living the past that comes to these issues. Thank you. Uh, the, the first, as you had mentioned about the constitution, you know, it's, it's this um, paragon of uh, a democratic constitution and all those provisions for fundamental rights. And, but it, but to, uh, uh, a few other uh, legislation in, in particular, South Africa has also gone uh, further. You have the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act, and then in the Employment Equity Act, the first part uh, clearly stipulates what is fair discrimination and then what is unfair discrimination. And here we are in Malaysia in the midst of, I don't know, it's in some kind of limbo. Uh, but in, in, in some kind of process of crafting a race relations act. But my question is, to what extent have these specific legislations governing um, public discourse, governing what is unfair discrimination, to what extent have they fostered good uh, race relations? And to what extent are they, you know, in what ways are they limited? And the second contrast about Malaysia and South Africa. So in Malaysia we have these uh, racially constituted parties. Um, in the ruling coalition. I'm no Malay and, and uh, representing Malay interests by, by its, its, you know, its mission, Chinese Party, Indian, and, and uh, various others in the coalition. Uh, South Africa's two main parties, at least, are not so African National Congress and the Democratic Alliance. And maybe the newer parties, Economic Freedom Front, you could say, are representing a particular uh, sectarian interest. But the African National Congress leading coalition uh, and then the leading opposition Democratic Alliance, and yet, some, in some ways, the election outcomes, the voting patterns, are markedly racially delineated. Race-based voting, especially for the Federal Opposition and Democratic Alliance, as far as I know, it's something in the order of 90, over 90% 90 of whites vote for the Democratic Alliance and blacks overwhelmingly vote for the National Congress and the other parties. So, you know, we, uh, I, I, many of us I'm in this room are agreement against race-based parties, but you know, we have an example in South Africa where parties are not race-based, but voting is very much still race-based. So, you know, to, uh, to what extent, you know, there's but basically, yeah, just what are your comments you know, on this and South Africa's uh, process? Why is voting still 
uh, so much race based and, and, and uh, for Malaysia, you know, uh, how, what impact would you see if we move away from race based parties? I think that the GRC process in South Africa, the truth and reconciliation process, was a very good idea. Uh, it started uh, as a part of a debate in the early 90s. It was premised on what was happening in Latin America at that time. But fundamentally, it was premised on what I might define personally as a, as a feature of a uh, uh, Protestant Christian ethic in terms of how uh, the Archbishop conceived and operated uh, the Truth Commission. So first in terms of the character of the Archbishop as well as uh, of uh, Alex Moray who was a lay Methodist priest in the Methodist Church. Uh, they fundamentally uh, took the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and postured it in a way where uh, voices could be heard. But that's all that happened. Voices were heard, mothers went to the Truth Commission and cried about where their sons were buried or not buried and what had happened to folk that had disappeared in exile uh, and so on. Uh, and some graves were found, others have not yet been found. So, to my mind, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the six volumes of reports that they produced have never brought the communities together. They have never taken those folk who were responsible for the detention, uh, those folk who were responsible for torture and murder, in our country to task. Hundreds of police officers, military intelligence officers, never went to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and confessed. It wasn't as if there were waves and waves of people that came to the Commission and said, I am sorry, mea culpa, forgive me. That did not happen. So there are folk that are still walking the streets of our country with impunity. They have killed, murdered, tortured people, but they still enjoy state pensions. Many of them were absorbed in the military in terms of a defense force that is supposed to defend the nation. Many are still in the police force. They are supposed to provide security to communities, and yet they have a hideous past. So, Liberation forces are supposed to work side by side with those individuals. So I don't think that the truth surfaced or reconciliation occurred. Also, I think that there were several other issues that uh, have dominated the situation. So South Africa is looked to as a model reconciliation process. And folk in Sri Lanka, for example, come to us and say, advise us. Uh, folk from Kosovo come to us and say, tell us how you went about your truth and reconciliation process. I think that they are looking in the wrong places. Because our conditions of truth and reconciliation was a spin. It has never succeeded in reconciling communities. It has never put down the bogey of racism or terrorism or murder uh, that took place during that time. The TRC also proposed compensation for victims. Very few of those victims have been compensated. So grandmothers are still sitting waiting for compensation for their grandchildren that were killed. And that compensation has never taken place. Communities have never been paid out. The ravages of apartheid and the forced removals that took place have never been reconciled. So you go to an area like Cape Town and you will find that District 6 is still a vast wasteland where people were forcefully removed. And the so-called Malay community that was settled in that area, 
there's just grass growing in that area. No houses have been constructed because there's still an angst 21 years later about who should own that property. And the capitalists, black or white, are sort of angling to take over that property. So there isn't a, a property reconciliation around forced removals or the Group Areas Act. Hundreds of thousands of people were moved from one area into another area. Many traditional African communities were moved. And the evidence is out there in terms of the Land Commission as well as other commissions that show that no forced removals have been repatriated. The other issue is also the prisons. There are almost between 200 and 4,000 individuals that were imprisoned during the apartheid era. The ANC government has not forgiven those people and many are still serving sentences. So there is a political divide around those folk that are sitting there charged with terrorism or sabotage. Some people have been released, others are still languishing in prison. And the Pan-Africanist Congress, for example, is asking that its members be released and they have not been released. So there is a divide and a romanticism around the truth and reconciliation uh, commissions. I think trust in the communities has not grown. So whilst people came to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and some confessed and some said we erred, the fact is that murders that took place, like that of Rick Turner, Ahmed Timor and others, are still irreconciled. Their families still don't know who was the perpetrator who killed their sons or grandsons. So there's a lot of unfinished business around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. If we turn to the South African Constitution and the race politics that plays itself out, I think the only hope is in turning these political parties into anti-racist entities. The notion of non-racialism fundamentally has a flawed analysis, and that is that it recognizes race. So I think that we have to aspire to anti-racism. We have to be able to say that there is no such thing as race, that we are all human beings. All of us have the same strengths, weaknesses, feelings, and emotions, and that you should practice those rather than race-based politics. And certainly the ANC, whilst it has the notion of non-racialism, if you look at the number of cabinet ministers, if you look at the number of functionaries, over a period of 20 years, you will see a downward erosion that more and more African people are being appointed and that folk that participated in the struggle are now being marginalized. <coughs> so there is no merit uh, appointments, even in political parties. People are campaigning on the basis that we must have a minister in this function or that function, based on that minister's race, not on the competency of that person. On the other hand, we have a virulent opposition that's coming up, a youthful opposition group like the Economic Freedom Front, which is formed out of the ANC, and that's an interesting notion as to whether ruling parties break up and splinter and that other groups emerge out of those ruling parties and whether there is hope within the EFF as well. The fact of the matter is that when you look at the leadership of the EFF, you find very few people of other races and other groups in the EFF, in the leadership positions. And I think that is a worrisome feature as to how do you take uh, these communities and make them accept uh, uh, rightful role. Against that sort of position, I think that we also have to criticize the so-called minority communities. That the minority communities, whilst they might have participated in the struggle against apartheid, are now today fixated more on making economic gains. So they're into business and enterprise, 
looking at how they can get a share of the economic pie in South Africa. They are not interested in going into politics and playing a political role. So you'll find that young professionals, they'll aspire to becoming a partner in an international law firm or an international accounting firm, but won't say, can I take my skills back into government and function as a government official or a politician that can add weight to the community in South Africa. And I think that we need to recognize that fault line and ensure that university graduates participate fully because without that participation, we create the space, we create the vacuum for others to take over. Dan common law di Afrika dipelihara ataupun sebaliknya dipelihara ini saya nak tanya adakah dipelihara dengan begitu baik ataupun tidak uh, kalau di Malaysia hak orang asal dan asli tidak dipelihara dengan begitu baik uh, dan dis diskriminasi dari pelbagai sudut itu saja Let me do this on the mic. Um, the question that we just received was, are orang asli um, or indigenous rights and common law protected well in Malaysia? And in Malaysia, uh, orang asli uh, in, in Malaysia, orang asli rights are not well protected. So um, that was the, the question. How is it like in, in South Africa? Um, I'm reminded that when Malaya uh, gained her independence from the British in 1957, in the first Rodeca cabinet, when three major races came together in Malaya, there was an understanding in cabinet that uh, a Malay would be prime minister, uh, an ethnic Indian would hold labor as a portfolio, and an ethnic Chinese would hold finance uh, as a portfolio. And this went on uh, uh, till about the uh, mid uh, 70s um, uh, until it was changed. So I'm so the idea that uh, people still think of race in terms of cabinet compositions and things like that was an important feature. And today, uh, people have, in a sense, forgotten that. Uh, some people rule that it's no longer practiced. Some people say that this is uh, a measure of progress. Uh, but it's interesting, again, a, a, a quick story to relate to you. As I was traveling here this morning by taxi, uh, I had a Malay taxi driver and he, uh, he kind of assumed that I wasn't an ethnic Malay and so he was describing an incident when he was, uh, when he was banged from the back by uh, a driver and he was at pains to tell me that this was a Malay driver who had banged him from the back and for him, uh, race was obviously still something that was there in his mind whether it was an important feature or whether it was just merely to describe the incident it was nevertheless uh, a conversation that was uh, framed uh, in some racial terms. So my, my first question to you, I apologize as a lawyer, it's a, a multi-tiered question. Uh, my, my first question to you is, how possible is it at the end of the day to totally eradicate race uh, from our thinking? Is there some de minimis element that will always uh, ultimately uh, exist? Secondly, when you look at the reforms in South Africa, we all followed it and we all cheered when uh, apartheid was brought down and uh, Madiba became president and things like that. But now looking on, you know, many presidents later, now under Jacob Zuma, is there a, a sense that support for uh, anti-racism and things like that is waning uh, in South Africa? And uh, my third and final question is, you've got all your chapter nine uh, institutions and you've now said that they are, they are facing severe both budgetary and even cabinet pressure, political pressure. So how important is it uh, or how necessary is it to have an independent judiciary uh, to uphold and to protect and in some ways advance the uh, very dynamic and important changes that were incorporated uh, into uh, the South African constitution. 
Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go back to the constitutional provision and common law. I think it's a very fascinating question because when the folk, the constitutional lawyers and the politicians were writing our constitution, uh, they totally omitted uh, the rights uh, in terms of what was traditional uh, customary law in South Africa. And I say this uh, given the experience of the past uh, 20 years, that there was initially uh, a historical recognition by the colonial powers, both the British colonies that were established in the uh, Natal area as well as the Cape colonies about traditional law and powers. Under the Afrikaans administrations and under apartheid, traditional law was relegated to the so-called rural homeland areas. So whatever happened in those areas was seen as not affecting metropolitan South Africa. So land rights, uh, marriage rights and so on were relegated into those areas and were not brought into the metropolitan law of South Africa. So where women went to the courts to say, my house has been taken over because my husband died and now his brothers have come to claim back their house and property, that that woman had no rights. Where women who aspired to traditional leadership positions were also uh, pushed out by men who said, I am the brother to the chief and therefore I have the right to ascend to this kingdom and the sister or the mother does not have the right to ascend to the kingdom, were also relegated. So there has been a conflict in our laws regarding customary law. And this extends into other faith-based communities as well. So under apartheid legislation, Hindu marriages or Muslim marriages have never been recognized. The law was a Protestant law taken from Roman uh, Dutch law. And that basically said that a marriage was only consecrated in terms of Roman Dutch law. So faith-based marriages have never been recognized in South Africa. There is a piece of legislation before Parliament to recognize Muslim uh, marriages, but that has sort of had a stillborn uh, relationship in Parliament because it has never been passed by Parliament yet. So there is a conflict between traditional law and common law and constitutional law. What is interesting now is that traditional councils are being appointed in those rural areas. So instead of having three layers of government, a national, provincial and local government, we are now subtly, without having it in the constitution, a fourth layer of government which is a traditional council or a traditional authority. Now, the South African government spends about 500 million rands each year supporting traditional leadership. It pays paramount kings, chiefs, indunas, a stipend to regulate relationships in traditional areas, which are mainly rural areas. So there would be no traditional authority in an area like Soweto, but there would be a traditional authority in some rural area in the Mokopo province. A fourth layer of government is now coming into being, but that fourth layer of government is also susceptible to corruption. Let me give you one example. Mining corporations are going into areas like Pumalanga and Nampopo and saying, we want to start a mine. They would ignore the Department of Mineral Resources and go to the local chief, bribe the local chief, 10 bottles of whiskey or 10,000 rands 
or some small share participation in the company and would say, sign off on these papers so we get mineral extraction rights. The chief would sign off on that. But all the attendant pollution and aftermath of mining is never attended to. So you will find that good grazing land, good land on which crops could be uh, harvested, no longer operates. A mine would come in, mine the coal, and then walk away and not restore the land. So we have an asbestos legacy, we have in the gold mining areas a legacy of silicosis. And in provinces like Pumalanga and Mpopo, we have coal mines that are now surfacing, that are doing alluvial mining, but never compensating the communities. So the chief gets rich, but that richness does not transcend into richness for the communities or the folk that he is supposed to be protected. And the role is one of protection and service. It is not one of accumulation of wealth. That was what the traditional leadership concept was all about. So that is being eroded. So we can debate uh, those issues a little later because I think that there is a rich history there that we need to uh, interrogate. If we come back to this issue of incipient racism, I think that it is only through a new generation of young people schooling together, living together, working together, that we can start removing the racial barriers. So you will find at universities, young people, black and white, walking together, sharing lunch, eating together, having partnerships of their own and so on. And it is through those activities that I think that we can build uh, a non-racial, anti-racist community. I have a granddaughter who's four years old. She doesn't talk to me about race. She talks to me about her friends, Sybil and John, and how they fight at school together, how they play together, and so on. And that is my hope for South Africa that she, as she's growing up, doesn't recognize race. She has not been ghettoized into one community. And we can only, as parents and grandparents, encourage that role. So where communities want to mix across culture, race, and so on, that we do that. We also need to use our platforms in the various schools to ensure that people begin to understand the culture, the relationships, faith-based uh, organizations, have to do a lot more work uh, in these communities. So, nearby our offices in Johannesburg, there's a large immigrant Somali community. There's also a local so-called Indian community. Both are faith-based in the Muslim religion, and yet they will not share the same mosque. They will not congregate together or pray together. So that disharmony tells you a lot about race-based politics in South Africa. Uh, it tells you that even faith-based leaders uh, are not willing to stand up and talk about xenophobic violence. And we had that outbreak earlier this year. And very few faith-based leaders stood up and said, this is evil, that the Almighty never asked of us to be segregating communities in this fashion. So the silence of the faith leaders is something that we need to condemn and that we need to encourage them to speak out and go back to the holy books and say, there is no race-based positions in our holy books. So why do we perpetuate that in our communities? In terms of the chapter nine institutions, I think that they have not been aggressive enough. They have been pretty compliant. They have not stood up and said on their own that we will challenge these positions that government has or that we will strike out and condemn the actions of political leaders. They should be standing up and speaking out when cabinet ministers are talking a race-based language. That is their mandate constitutionally. That is what the country pays them for. So we need to encourage them to participate and be working harder and faster on those kinds of issues. 
A further point that I want to make about this is that philanthropy in South Africa doesn't promote the Chapter 9 institutions. And what strategic government function, I think that there are plans and activities that could be undertaken that could be philanthropy based. So where rich individuals have corporate funds, they might be able to say, we will give you a million rands or two million rands, but go into this conflict area and start looking at reducing community conflict and reducing the tensions that exist. About two months ago, the judiciary took on the presidency because a number of politicians were saying that this judiciary is an anti-ANC judiciary. And to a person, the judges in the country objected to this uh, position. They demanded a meeting with the president and the president very quickly, within a fortnight, agreed to meet with the judiciary at the head of the constitutional court and with, a, with some other sort of judges across the spectrum of the hierarchy of our courts. About 20 judges met with the presidency. The presidency came out and said, we are not against an independent judiciary. But now we need to broaden that space. We need to fight for that space and say the judiciary must be independent.